So we are now ready to get started. My name is Hannah Millen and I am the manager of individual giving here at the Morris Museum. And I'm so excited to welcome you to our second event for Member Appreciation Month. Uh, we had our first event this past Monday with Brett Messenger and I'm so excited for today's event with Jillian. And uh, just a couple of things to know, we do have some upcoming Member Appreciation Month events next week that I just wanted to put on everybody's radar. Uh, next Monday, we are going to be having our 20 year member tea. This is for members who have been a part of the Morris Museum for 20 plus years. Uh, it's going to be a Zoom event this year. Next Tuesday, uh, we will have our first on site event, which I'm very excited about. It's going to be one of three on site events we are doing. We are inviting some of our artists from the Dissonance exhibition to come in and do a sort of informal meet and greet with our members. So throughout the day, we'll have artists coming in and out. And it's your chance to get to know them, get to ask them any questions about their work. If you've seen the show already, uh, you can see uh, the artists speak about their work. If you haven't seen it, it's a great opportunity to see it for the first time and meet some of the artists. Um, I believe next week we have about 15 artists coming in throughout the day. They're gonna be rotating in two hour shifts. We are not doing any reservations for this, so it is a first come, first serve, and there is a capacity restriction on the gallery, but it's something I'm really excited about, and I hope you take advantage of it. And then next Friday, our last event for the week is going to be the first ever Morris Museum Trivia Night. I'm very excited to try something like this, uh, where you can test your knowledge about the Morris Museum. So that's all we have coming up next week. There's information on our membership page about it. I will be sending out an email to members to, uh, tomorrow as well with some information about next week's events and you'll keep getting updates from me throughout the week. Uh, so without further ado, I am going to um, introduce Jillian. Jillian Suss is our collections manager and registrar and I'm very excited uh, for you to see what she has in store for you today. So Jillian, would you like to just briefly introduce yourself and kind of tell us how you came to the Morris Museum? Sure. Um, so as Hannah said, my name is Jillian Suss and I'm the collections manager and registrar here at the Mars Museum. I've been here for exactly one year as of this week. Um, so as collections manager and registrar, I keep track of and care for all of the objects in the museum's collection and any other objects that enter or leave the building, such as exhibit loans. In addition, I insist with installing and hanging exhibits, which we're currently in the middle of right now, but I'll get to that a little bit more later. I also advise the museum on everything ranging from gift and loan procedures to collections care to bug control. Um, before coming to the Morris Museum, I worked with the musical instruments department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art during their gallery renovation project. And I also spent time in North Carolina where I worked with the Duke University Musical Instrument Collections, the City of Raleigh Art Collection, and the Nasher Museum of Art at Duke University. Uh, one of the best parts of my job, I think, is discovering new and exciting objects in our collection and in storage that most people don't get to see. So, um, I'm looking forward to sharing some of my current favorites with you, uh, but you got to keep in mind that I'm always finding new things in storage. So what my favorites might be today could change in a couple months. Awesome. And then just really briefly, uh, could you go into the difference between a collections manager and a registrar? So the different tasks that you would do under each position? Sure. Um, Collections managers and registrars often do similar jobs and it really sort of depends on the size of the institution at which you work. So for my current job here, I would describe collections manager as the carer and keeper of the objects in the permanent collection. So I keep track of everything in storage and make sure that it's safe and I try to know where everything is so I can find it. And I also keep track of things like the environment in the museum and uh, pests and stuff like that. A uh, registrar is more of the coordinating side of things. So when objects are coming into the building, I work on scheduling that and working with shippers and art handlers and 
uh, just organizing all of the files related to loans and exhibits, whereas collections manager is much more for the permanent collection. I forgot I was muted. Very cool. Um, so I'm going to give you a second just to queue up. I know you have a slideshow. Uh, I'm going to give you a second to queue that up. Uh, for the rest of the presentation, if anybody has any questions for Jillian at any time, feel free to put them in the chat and we will try and answer them in a timely manner if we don't get to it. If it's about a specific object and we don't get to it during that block, we'll answer it towards the end of the, uh, the discussion. And I will turn it over to you, Jillian. All right. Now I just need to share my screen with everyone. Here we go. So welcome. I'm very excited to have you guys all here. Um, I'm just gonna talk some about some objects that I've come across in the past year that tickle me or that I think are beautiful and it's really just my opinion and things that I think are special that I'm happy to share with you guys. So, here we go. A few months ago, a researcher working with the Marvin Lepofsky Foundation contacted the museum asking if we had any works by that artist in our collection. Since this wasn't an artist or objects that I was familiar with, I searched in our database and came across four pieces by Lepofsky. This piece, this piece, a smaller vase, and this, my favorite, a red glass pickle. The thing about research inquiries is that I get to learn more about the objects while I'm researching them for the researchers. So here's what I learned about our pickle. Marvin Lepofsky was a glass artist who was active in the mid and the late 20th century. In 1972, he created a series called the Great American Food Series, where he made molds from actual food that he then turned into glass objects. The foods he included were fried chicken from KFC, a quarter pounder with cheese, and a kosher dill pickle from a deli in Philadelphia. But what made me fall in love with this piece is that Lepofsky actually created a lot of red of glass pickles. They weren't anything really special for him to have created. And he gave them to friends and families as holiday gifts. So a lot of people have pickles in their collections. Compared to the other works that we have by Lepofsky, our pickle isn't really unique, but just because I'd never come across a red glass pickle before in all of my time working in museums, I think that it's a treasure that I'm happy to share with you. The next special and unique, oh, Yes, Hannah. A question about the pickle. Yes. How big is the pickle? It is pickle sized. I have it right here. If you'd like to see it, just let me put on some gloves. I would love to see it. <laughs> this is one of my favorite things about going down into Jillian's office. Every time I go down there, there's something different that I can look at and something fun and unique that I get to see. And I'm so excited to see this pickle. So. Let's see. It's a little hard to see. There we go. That is indeed pickle sized. It is a pickle sized pickle. It would be a really nice juicy dill pickle to take a bite of, but not red glass. <laughs> All right, should I keep going now? Any other questions? We do have a, a question from Gary Knapp, a general question. Okay. Uh, how many objects are in our permanent collection? Our permanent collection is made up of over 40,000 objects. We have everything ranging from red glass pickles to paintings and drawings and sculptures um, to rocks and minerals and fossils and decorative arts and furniture and everything in between. We've got a, a large collection of a huge amount of things. Awesome. 
And then uh, there's a second part to the, actually a second and a third part to this question. Okay. How much of it is on display if you had to choose a percentage and where is the rest of the collection housed? Um, for museums, at any given time, there's probably only about 10% of the permanent collection on exhibit. I think that here at the museum, it's probably even less than that uh, because we have so many uh, special exhibits around the building. So most of the time, our collection is stored in our storage areas, our secure vault and our costume storage areas and the Guinness collection has their own vault as well. Very cool. And thank you, Gary, for that question. Yes, thank you. Please keep asking questions. Um, I'm going to talk about the next piece that I think is really something cool and that I would not have known about if one of our volunteers, Ruth, hadn't come across something in the work that she was doing um, that she was curious about. So she asked me about it and we were able to find it in the vault. So this is a petite point embroidery of George Washington that is pretty amazing, um, especially when you see it in person. I have a couple detail shots here that you can see, but it really doesn't do it justice. Petite point is similar to cross stitch, but it's even tinier and more delicate and more detailed. It's worked usually with individual threads on fine canvas. So when Ruth asked about this and in preparing for this presentation today, I was able to go through the files in my office to learn a little bit more about this piece. So what I learned is that this embroidery is actually based on a painting by Gilbert Stewart which was created in 1796 and is in the collection of the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. It was commissioned by Senator William Bingham as a gift for English statesman William Petty, first Marcus of Lansdowne. This painting is evocative of European portraiture traditions, but also includes references to the newly formed United States and its past and present leadership. This painting of George Washington was described as Gilbert Stuart's grandest achievement and is the only full-length portrait to depict Washington as president and not general. Many versions of this portrait were commissioned by Washington's political supporters. And as you can see, it was even copied by amateur craftspeople people like Hester Ann Boylan, who created this petty point inspired by the painting. I was telling a friend of mine about this and I was telling her how we have this really kind of amazing cross stitch with a frame that is of the time period that the cross stitch was created in the 1800s. And I was like, it's based on this portrait by Gilbert Stewart. And she was like, oh, what portrait? I was like, the Lansdowne, Washington. And she was like, oh my gosh that's a really important portrait of George Washington. And I was like, yeah, and we've got this really cool, very fancy, delicate embroidery that's based on it. So I thought that was pretty special. Definitely fitting considering Morristown's revolutionary history. And exactly. Washington here. Yeah, definitely. I wish I knew more about the artist and the history of the artist and maybe if she even met him when he was in Morristown and or if she's even from around here. Uh, but that's some research for another day, I think. <laughs> So on the opposite side of things, where I can tell you a lot about that great embroidery of George Washington and its inspiration, our collection also has really sweet things like this French tile, which we unfortunately don't know too much about. I found this tile as I was trying to find some objects to teach my intern how to handle collections objects. And I just, I thought it was very sweet and, and simple to handle for the most part. But this is the first instance and not the last in this presentation where we just don't have that much information about the object. 
by studying its object file, which I keep in my office, we know that it was given to the museum in 1963 and who gave it. And we know that it came with a couple other French tiles as well as Delft tiles and an iron horse and cart. And it's okay that we don't know that much about this piece because you can't ever know everything about everything in your collection. There's always more work to be done. Um, but it's just a really sweet piece that I, I'm happy to share with you. And I actually have it over here in my office if you guys would like to see it in real time. Yes, please. So here it is. It's very sweet. It's, um, I wish that I had time to really learn about how it was created. Um, unfortunately, I can just tell you that it's a painted tile. I don't know if it's what it's painted with or what sort of tile or what it would have been used for, but hopefully someday we'll be able to do some research into it and find that out. That's awesome. And Jillian, we do have a question. Uh, this question comes to us from Janicia Kamen, one of our members, and it's about the embroidery that you showed uh, before this little tile. Do we know how the embroidery came into the collection? It was given to us as a gift. Let me check my notes. It seems that a lot of the objects in our collection have been given to us as gifts. Uh, multiple people have given multiple objects to us. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. There's a couple names of guests today at this webinar who I know have given us some gifts in our collection. Um, I wish I knew more about how it came to be, um, but unfortunately I don't with, with some of the pieces, uh, they are works that were passed down through generations of families. Um, I know one of the pieces that I'll talk about a little later was given to us by the grandchild of the person who commissioned the pieces, I think. So, um, in many instances, that's just what it is, and we were happy to take these great pieces of art um, that had been passed down through family generations. Oh, speaking of which, uh, the next pieces that I'm going to talk about, I'm pretty sure came from the grandchild of the person who commissioned them. And that are my cow friends. <laughs> These paintings live right up here in my office, right up here. So whenever I need to take a break from sending emails or um, looking at my computer, I can look up at these very silly cows, Texas Jack and Texas Jill. Uh, they were created by Effie Cheney, who was an untrained artist active in the United States in the mid to late 19th century. So what I learned while working on this presentation is that Texas Jack and Texas Jill are a special breed of cattle that were made for a better grade of beef and to withstand Texas winters, which I guess could be a little harsh. Um, in looking at our files, I also learned that in 1880, Texas Jack was featured in a livestock show in Kansas City where he received numerous honors and following those recognitions, he was slaughtered so that they could try his meat and judge the quality of his meat. His cook beef was awarded first place and was served at local hotels in Kansas City. Our files also sometimes offer a glimpse into the historic documentation that came with objects, some of which is less objective and a little more fun than what we usually aim to use to describe our objects today, including this note, which I found in our files about Texas Jack and Texas Jill. 
A lady artist of the 19th century, Miss Cheney never received a formal lesson in art, but has produced this fine pair of bovine primitives. Unintentionally awkward, they are charming nevertheless. They clearly portray two prize-winning cattle of the 1850s. The block-like clumsiness of the animals is counterpointed by the wildflowers growing in the meadows and the calmness of the waterfall. It just makes me smile. <laughs> I do think it's quite humorous that they're Texas Jack and Texas Jill, and I wonder whatever happened to the real Texas Jill since we know what happened to Texas Jack. Well, I hope that, that her beef was just as tasty. <laughs> I hope so, too. Yeah. <laughs> we do have a couple of questions. Um, okay, absolutely. One of them comes, another question from Janicia came in, and then a question from Margie Wong, who's one of our trustees at the museum. Uh, and they are both pretty uh, similar, actually. They are both asking about how do we decide what objects we accept into our collection from uh, donors? So how do we go about that process of acquisition? <sighs> That is um, an interesting question because it's a little more behind the scenes, which is what I get to do and I enjoy doing. Um, when an object is presented to us as a gift for possible accession, uh, usually an email or a phone call is sent and we try to collect as much information about that piece as possible. So I ask for pictures, and provenance, which is the history of the ownership of the object and any other information that the potential donor might have. It's not up to me to choose if we take something or not. So I then send that information to my boss, Ron Labaco, who is the curator, the head curator and director of exhibitions um, and the head of collections here. And Ron, evaluates it given his understanding of what the object is and uh, where it may or may not fit in our collection. And then we also present that to Cleveland uh, Johnson, who's our director of the museum. Now in evaluating potential gifts, we have a policy, a written policy that really helps guide us. And we really try to be informed by the museum's mission when making those decisions. Um, so if we decide that something is worthwhile, that fits the museum's mission, that fills a gap in our collection, or is something really, really special, we then present that possible object to a collections and exhibitions committee and then they make a recommendation to our board of trustees as to whether or not it should be accepted. And if it's decided to be accepted, then it comes back to me and I put together all of the paperwork and figure out how to get the object in the building. Sounds like a very long time intensive process. It can be, yes. It definitely takes time. We can't just accept everything. And we don't want to just accept everything because we don't have the room for it. And we really have a very clear mission and vision for the museum. And we want to make sure that we stick with that as we collect. Awesome. Thank you very much, Margie and Janicia, for your questions. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to move on to another object that makes me very happy because <laughs> they all make me very happy. That's why I chose them to share. So early in my time at the Morris Museum, I was given a tour of our costume and textile collection by our wonderful volunteer, Ruth. And we turned a corner into a room and I saw this. And it was black and it was multicolored polka dots and it was peeking out at me. And I fell in love immediately. <laughs> I think this dress is absolutely amazing. It's from the spring 1987 collection by Arnold Scazzi. And um, we have a lot of works in our collection by Scazzi. But it was exciting to me to learn about Arnold Scazzi because he was not an artist designer that I had ever heard of prior to working here at the Mar 
Mars Museum. And really, I just like colorful and polka dotted things. And sometimes that's just how objects become my favorites because they're colorful or sparkly or polka dotted and they just make me happy. Definitely a beautiful dress and definitely something I could see you wearing potentially. Oh my goodness. It would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> my wedding dress was very good. But if I did it again, it might be a dress like this. <laughs> Fits the day. So our next piece is this beautiful jar that I discovered while I was searching the objects in our collection for something that we could share on our social media platforms in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day uh, a month and a half ago. And so what this object really illustrates is another thing that excites me about working with collections is when instead of learning about people and art and objects that I'm not familiar with, I recognize an artist. And so I learned about Maria Martinez when I was taking an American art class in college. And Maria Martinez was a Native American artist who worked with the San Ildefonso Pueblo. First with her husband, she created lovely pieces like this, and then later with her son and daughter-in-law, Santana Martinez. And I've always just been drawn to her simple, beautiful black on black earthenware designs. And I still really do find them lovely in their simplicity. And I have this one in my office too, to show you guys. Ooh, perfect. I would love to see it. I actually think the picture that I took is probably better because you can see the detail in the piece a lot better. And I just have dark bookcases behind me. But it's not anything big or fancy, but it's got a nice weight to it. And it really is just beautiful. And for me to be able to hold a piece of art by an artist that I admire is something that always and forever thrills me. And it's why I do what I do. That's amazing. And it's such a beautiful example of pottery. It really is. We have a question from a member. Uh, where is the Pueblo um, located that Maria Martinez was affiliated with? I'm pretty sure it's New Mexico, but you would have to double check me on that one. I think the San Ildefonso Pueblo is in New Mexico. And we have confirmation. Yes, Gary Knapp saying it is in New Mexico. Thank you so much, Gary. <laughs> and thank you for your question. Um, I only see the first initial on the last name, but I believe it's Janet Breadlaw. Thank you. So last but not least, <laughs> I wanted to share some puppets with you. Because I love puppets and the Mars Museum has some puppets in its collection. Puppets hold a very special place in my heart because I did an internship at the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, Georgia when I was in graduate school. And I learned more about puppets than I ever thought I could. And you know, you, you really don't realize how prevalent puppets are and that um, there are these really special and unique things that are around more than you would ever think. Now, I know some people probably think of this puppet, this punch puppet, as the sort of puppet you think of when I say puppet. And I can keep saying the word puppet repeatedly. Um, so, you know, you think of this very European, exaggerated features, this very classic look. But there are also, there's a tradition of puppetry in many non-Western Asian, South Asian societies, like this Burmese string puppet that I was just very excited to find in the collection. This is another instance where unfortunately there's not a lot of information about this object, but I just wanted to share him to, to really show you what sort of exists in our collection and the range of our collection and what exists in the world. Um, and I think that he's a really lovely string puppet. <laughs> um, so as you can see, 
My work here allows me to get really up close and personal with the objects in our collection, as well as the objects that come in and out for exhibits. So I'm going to close my presentation with some detail images that I was able to take of pieces in our upcoming exhibition, Threads of Consciousness, the Tapestries of John Eric Rees, which is what we're currently installing today and I will run back to when this is over, um, and which opens to the public November 20th. But it opens to members on November 19th, the day before, as part of Member Appreciation Month. We are opening the gallery for the entire day, giving members a chance to see it first. Uh, time slots are required for this one, and there's information on the membership page, and I will be sending out emails about it in the coming week or so, but just something to keep on your radar. So John Eric Reese lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and is considered by many, many to be the nation's leading contemporary tapestry artist. He often imbues his subject matter with highly critical social and cultural ideas and he creates extraordinary works of woven silk and metallic thread with textured undulating surfaces of hand-stitched pearls, crystals, and glass beads. His works sparkle with detail and life, and I really encourage you to come visit the museum to see the exhibit and see these details in person because the pieces are really spectacular and they're gonna look amazing. You just have to see them in person. I've told my mom, she's gotta come see them in person. Like, it's worth it. Um, so at this point, I'd love to answer any more questions. If anybody has them, I can stop sharing my screen. And just a couple of things to know uh, about the John Eric Reese exhibition. I snuck in yesterday in the middle of install and it looks absolutely gorgeous. One of the tapestries, one of the larger tapestries, if I'm correct, is already up on the wall and I could not get away from it. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's definitely worth checking out. And we currently have a tapestry from uh, John Eric Reese hanging up in our entry pavilion as a sort of teaser sneak peek. Uh, it's called Icarus II. There was a photograph of it in um, a member email from last week of Jillian and our art installer, Sarah O'Connor, doing a fun little pose mimicking the tapestry itself. It's very beautiful. So definitely once the exhibition is open, please come check it out. Please take advantage of that member preview day. And I do see a couple of questions here. One comes to us from KR. Will the bear ever return to New Jersey Wildlife Exhibition? The New Jersey Wildlife Exhibition is currently closed as we're just trying to keep our museum safe during this crazy time. The bear currently has some condition issues um, and because of his size, uh, we will really need to get someone specialized in to take care of him. So I don't really know what the plans for him are, but maybe someday he'll be back. And then we have another question here from Will Leland. Uh, how much of the collection information is in a digital database and is that database available online? Our database is a work in progress. Uh, we're a very small museum and unfortunately, it just takes a lot of time and we're all very, very busy. So our database isn't in the best possible shape, but I'm working on it and I'm hoping to continue to get some interns in the future who can help me work on it. Um, and at this point in time, we do not have our collection online. So if there's ever anything specific you're looking for, you can just reach out to me and I'll see what I can find. Awesome, thank you so much for that question, Will. Uh, those are all of the questions that I have. So I think we're going to wrap it up for today. Thank you so much, Jillian, for kind of letting our members into your world and seeing the kind of things that you get to see on a daily basis. I really appreciate it. And I think everybody really enjoyed it. And thank you to our members for your continued support and for attending this event today. Keep your eye on your inboxes. We will be sending out updates about more events coming up soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Have Thank you. Time. Bye. Bye.